Welcome back, my friends. Currently, we're on day 248 of Russia's disastrous invasion of Ukraine. And today's top story is that Russia is claiming to have successfully repelled a Ukrainian drone attack on the Crimean fleet in the port city of Sevastopol. The Russian army is claiming to have destroyed nine aerial drones and seven maritime drones in a coordinated attack that occurred earlier this morning. Now, as of the time I'm filming this video, we don't have any good pictures or videos of the potential damage to the Black Sea Fleet, but I'm guessing at some point today, a Russian soldier will take that video and then leak it to social media. But we know that the Russians are lying because they're saying something. But of course, this strike on these ships were successful and Ukraine has released the drone footage. So this is a strike on the Admiral Markarov frigate. Uh, this is a very important ship to the Black Sea fleets. Now this attack happened in the middle of the night, so the drone video isn't the clearest, but I'll link it down below if you want to see it for yourself. So in response, Russia is suspending participation in the Ukrainian grain deal. Russia on Saturday suspended its participation in a landmark agreement that allowed vital grain exports from Ukraine, blaming alleged drone attacks on Russian ships in the port city of Sevastopol. So the hypocrisy here is outrageous. For weeks now, Russia has been launching Iranian kamikaze drones against civilian targets, Ukraine's electrical grid, and in response, the Ukrainian military attacked the Russian military, and Russia is upset, saying the Ukrainian grain deal can no longer continue. They're choosing to starve the people of North Africa and the Middle East. Those are the recipients of Ukrainian grain. Uh, rather than just attacking back the, the Ukrainian military. This is war, but apparently Russia doesn't know how to fight a proper war. Other batshit crazy news that I just have to share with you guys is the official Russian representative at the UN Security Council has accused the United States of developing virus-infected combat mosquitoes. So this is the Russian diplomat at the UN who made these claims that the United States is genetically engineering mosquitoes to go after Russian soldiers or the Russian people. As an American, I feel like I have to say this, but there are no secret battle mosquitoes that we are developing to unleash on Eastern Europe. This is insane for numerous reasons. Uh, the most obvious one I want to share with you is that winter is coming and mosquitoes don't really fight that well in November or December. I feel at this point, uh, Kremlin leadership has gone down to the first floor of the building and they've checked in with their interns and they're just gathering as many crazy ideas as they can. And at this point, it's, it's just spaghetti on the wall. They're just throwing anything that they can to see what will stick, what will stick with an international audience to make Russia look more sympathetic, or make this war look justified. Here's a follow-up uh, from my previous video talking about Russian propaganda and Russian state TV. They want to push this narrative that a holy war is now being conducted on Ukraine, that Muslims around the world should answer the call of jihad and go to Ukraine to fight for Russia. So here is Russia's top pro-Kremlin propagandist, Vladimir Zolyov. That's this man right here, and he's Jewish. And his guest today is uh, this man, who identifies as a Soviet atheist. So they're going to talk for about 30 or 40 seconds, and for some reason these two men can agree. Yes, this is a holy war, and Muslims should answer the call of jihad, to go fight for Russia in Ukraine. Кадырова традиционные ценности, у святейшего традиционные ценности. Я вообще атеист. Почему у меня ценности те же? Я никак не могу понять. Ну тяжелый это случай. Может, не настолько ты и атеист. Я? 
на сто процентов. Я старый советский человек. Но традиционные ценности, они потому и традиционные, что они остаются с нормальными людьми всегда. А с ненормальными не остаются. И в этом плане Кадыров прав, когда он говорит о том, что ну да, священная война прям пошла. На русском это вполне сеть же хода. In my opinion, both of these men are of military age. If they want to participate in a holy war against Ukraine, why don't they get a weapon and go to the front lines in Ukraine? That seems like the obvious answer to Russia's manpower problems. Speaking of which, according to a report from military economist Marcus Cup, he's estimating that Russia has realistically lost 60,000 soldiers killed and another 120,000 soldiers wounded. Let's ignore the DPR and LPR fighters. Nobody cares about them. But uh, uniformed Russian soldiers back in February, how many did they invade Ukraine with? And it was about 200,000 soldiers. So in eight months of fighting, Russia realistically has lost every soldier that they started this war with. So the only way that they can maintain this war and keep it going, obviously was through mobilization. Now, Russia's defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, announced that on Friday that the partial military mobilization campaign was officially over, and it's estimated that they did recruit about 300,000 Russian men over five weeks, with 82,000 of these mobilized men already fighting on the front lines in Ukraine. So what this probably does mean, because mobilization was very unpopular, is they're no longer going to be snatching 50-year-old diabetics off the streets to send them to Ukraine to fight. But the Russian military is still conscripting. They're still doing their normal recruitment. So if you're 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, more than likely you're going to get a letter from uh, Uncle Ivan and told that you need to report for military service. The other benefit of mobilization and these declarations of martial law is stop loss within the Russian military. So if you were a uh, conscript on a one-year mandatory service term, congratulations, you're staying in the military until you either die or Russia loses. And if you're a contract soldier that signed a three-year contract, you're not getting out, congrats, you're going to be staying in the military once again until you either die or Russia loses this war. So this is how Russia has solved their manning problems for now, but something tells me that if this war drags on another eight months, they're going to lose another 200,000 soldiers easily. So what is the reaction, what is the perception of ordinary Russians on the streets? Putin two days ago gave a rambling four-hour speech or something, and in it he announced that he was running for re-election in 2024. So this reporter is asking ordinary Russians on the streets, what do they think about Putin running for office? Is there anyone else in Russia they might want to be president? And this is the kind of responses that Putin is still receiving from the people. Sure. Кто бы мог заменить Путина в данный момент? Думаете, почему так вот за 20 лет не появилось никого, вот кого бы вы могли заметить? Ну почему? Потому что слишком много дел все-таки Путин делает для страны. Поэтому мы видим его дела. Кого я хочу на выборы? Президенты Путина обязательно. А еще кого-нибудь? Конкуренция, альтернатива. Так, еще могу сказать так. Тот, который у нас премьер-министром сейчас, Михаил Мишустин. Вот все. Но Путин на первом месте. Без оговоров. Как вы считаете, вот 20 лет у власти Владимира Путина? Это не важно совершенно. Он знает все. Поэтому мы в нем уверены. Мы ему доверяем во всем. Он у нас просто прекрасный президент. Лучше у нас еще не было. So 20 years of pro-Putin propaganda is working. Even if ordinary Russians are unhappy with the war and unhappy with mobilization, they're not blaming Putin. They don't think 
Putin is the problem. They think it's uh, corruption or the military or the FSB. Putin has done a very good job over these last eight months of shielding himself from any responsibility or blame. But the perceptions of ordinary Russians are changing. Data doesn't lie. The words mobilization and retreat, internet search data reveals Russia's changing concerns. Analysis of online research uh, and, and service statistics in Russia indicates a shift in the mood of Russian society, especially since mobilization over September and October. So more and more Russians are installing VPNs in order to access information outside of Russia. Russia does a very good job of blocking websites and stories that might give them an alternative narrative to what Putin wants them digesting every day. Here's a scary headline. Russians buy up iodine tablets amid heightened nuclear rhetoric. And my response to this headline is, what nuclear rhetoric from the West? Nobody in NATO or the United States is talking about using nuclear weapons. It's only Vladimir Putin and Russian state TV pushing this uh, heightened fear of a potential nuclear war breaking out. Nobody from the West is talking about using nuclear weapons ever. So hopefully Russians have this realization that they're the only ones talking about using nukes. The next clip I want to share with you is like something straight out of a World War II documentary. This is a teenage girl whose father has been mobilized, and she decided to get on the bus in order to give them a, uh, a pep talk, a, a speech of encouragement as they go to the front lines to fight for the motherland. This is something that you would see like, uh, you know, uh, soldiers being shipped off to defend Stalingrad in World War II. We're going to watch about 50 seconds of this clip together. Уважаемые товарищи земляки, дорогие наши защитники, сегодня мы провожаем вас на защиту Родины. Улыбнитесь, ребята, улыбнитесь, мы все с вами, все с вами. Ну-ка улыбнитесь, оставить слезы, мужчины. Мы с вами не прощаемся, мы все вас ждем. Еще соберемся все своим коллективом, всем районам будем встречать вас. Вы наши герои, защитники! Вы встали и пошли на защиту Родины! Вы не струсили! Этим надо гордиться! Мы гордимся всеми вами! Успехов вам, ребята! Берегите себя! Берегите друг друга! Берегите друг друга! Мы... These men are all going to be blackout drunk on this bus probably within 30 minutes. But just listening to this teenage girl talk about defending the motherland, it just feels like, you know, World War II and Stalingrad. Uh, I'm reminded of the Jumanji meme. What year is it? They're the aggressors. They're the military force that's currently on offense. And this is the reality of Russian soldiers currently in Ukraine. Once these mobilized men are sent to the front, Leadership is going to decide if they're valuable or if they're not valuable. And if they're not valuable, then they're just cannon fodder. So in a previous video, I shared one of these clips, but more and more intel is getting out how the Russians are organizing their front lines. Russia has a second front line set up just to kill its deserters. So on the fronts, they're putting the prisoners and criminals, the undesirables and the minorities, people Russian leadership doesn't care about. The second line of defense is being told, shoot anyone that tries to desert, shoot anyone that tries to retreat. Nobody is allowed to retreat anymore. It's horrific, but this is how Russia has been fighting wars for hundreds of years. And here's a video I have to share with you guys of a captured Russian soldier. This is a POW who was taken prisoners by the Ukrainians. And he's being interviewed in this video, and he just starts breaking down and crying as he describes the treatment that he's received from the Ukrainian forces so far. <laughs> Ukraine, 
ну, говорят, там, выходите, тут давай. Э, мы вышли, нас как бы э, взяли. Э, э, нет, нас не били. Нас как бы, да, там некоторые ругаются, понятно, что все злые на нас. Ну, нас не били, нас кормили, мы, мы курили. Нам дали конфеты, хлеб, который там ни разу не дали. Дали воду. Я не знаю, надо, может, правда, протест, надо что-то делать. Просто, просто везут мужей, детей просто везут их сюда. И тут мы как скот угодим просто. Я, ну, я вот так сказать, вот я это видел. Я сказал, чтобы все подумали, что нам нужно. Нужно ли нам это? Нам это зачем нам, нам, нам вам это нужно? Нам, вам нужно все или не мы? Украина, правда, надо откладывать? Не надо мне кому смотреть, все, русские, все говорят на русском языке. Здесь я, куда, как, куда меня не возили, здесь со мной по-русски с тобой нормально общаются. Такого то, что говорят в интернете, рассказывать никогда такого. Ну, не было здесь такого. Здесь мы сами же видели, что здесь такое хорошее отношение. So here's a Russian soldier saying that we're being treated better as prisoners by the Ukrainians than by the regular Russian military. When we look at the military map, there actually hasn't been a lot of changes over the last couple weeks. And as we get into worser weather, it's currently mud season in Ukraine. But as snow starts falling on the ground and it gets colder, Offensive operations are just more and more difficult. So more than likely for the next couple weeks, so the next couple months, these might be the front lines and both sides will just freeze in place. When we talk about the north bank of the uh, Dnipro River in Kherson, it might not be to Ukraine's benefits to uh, finish off this region, to retake it all. First of all, the humanitarian aspect, if you were trying to liberate and save these people, Russia's already stolen them. Russia has forced deported tens of thousands of Ukrainian citizens. They've completely evacuated everyone from this region. They've also stolen everything of value. They've literally taken the fire trucks, the ambulances, for sure all the washing machines. So as far as an incentive for the Ukrainian military to liberate this region. The people are gone and all the stuff is gone. So it might not be to Ukraine's benefits to finish off the Russian forces in this region if statistically Russia is incurring higher casualty rates than they're inflicting on the Ukrainians. So if in this region, let's say 200 Russian soldiers a day are dying to artillery fire, and the Russians in response are only killing 20 Ukrainian soldiers a day, uh, a 10 to 1 ratio on a battlefield that benefits Ukraine, they will take that all day. In effect, this is an open wound for Russia, and Russia probably wants to give it up aside from the propaganda loss they would experience. But if Russia gives up on the north bank of this river, if they give up on the city of Kherson, they're going to reallocate those soldiers to the Donbass region or Kharkiv or Zaporizhia. And then maybe the imbalance, the benefit that the Ukrainian military is getting, isn't as high. So for that reason, uh, the Ukrainian military might choose not to finish this off as they draw Russians across the river. They're at a strategic disadvantage. There also is the concern that if they officially lose this territory, They'll blow the hydroelectric power plants and then start bombing and artillery shelling the entire city of Kherson just to destroy it and, and deny the Ukrainians from, from having it. The next clip I want to share with you is an interview that was done with President Zelensky and an Italian journalist. This man's name is Lorenzo Cremonesi, and normally when... President Zelensky speaks to uh, foreign heads of state or reporters, he'll use a translator. In the first week of the war, he was speaking English to anyone that would listen to him, anyone that would hear his message. And that actually had a profound impact on me, the fact that he could communicate in English, my native tongue, it made me understand and like him better than just going through a translator. But he made a political decision the last seven months to only speak Ukrainian or Russian and then use translators for every, for every other language. However, in this exchange with this Italian journalist, he breaks out into English because he wants this man to understand him. 
This man asks the question, why should Italy participate in sanctions? Why should the Italian economy suffer uh, not doing business with Russia just to benefit Ukraine? So this was enough to uh, get President Zelensky riled up, and this is what he had to say. If I am a, an entrepreneur from Bergamo, from Brescia, from Milano, and come to you, Mr. Zelensky, why should I pay? Why should I close my industry? Why because I you, you, you pay for your freedom, not because of Ukraine. You pay for your freedom, but you will not pay next year. You will find the alternative. The world, the Europe will find jointly the alternative. And you will not pay next year, then the year after. And your children will not pay. But if you want, don't want uh, to do it now, you, your children, you will do it, do it, and Russia will decide politically what to do in Italy. Russia will buy real estate in Italy and decide how to live or how not to live. It's very comfortable to eat Italian food and to say that we don't like Europe. It's very comfortable to be in Toscana, to have the villas everywhere. It's very comfortable, you know, to relax in Europe, in clean, democratic Europe, uh, to ride on, on great Italian cars, etc. It's very great. And then to come back, stolen money, stolen money, because of corruption there, fully corruption, stolen money and pay for this war, and uh, on elections, always uh, choose Putin. It's very good to say something there, and then to relax on, on, on the sea, in Italy. So, if you don't love this uh, civilization, live there, have read there, and please buy Russian cars, great, the best cars in the world, buy them. Very well said. President Zelensky is a very gifted communicator, even in English. Final two clips I have for you. Uh, the first one is of a Ukrainian defender who's helping evacuate civilians. And while searching this house, he noticed a civilian pet that had been left behind, so he chose to rescue this animal. Take a second and try and guess what animal it will be. The Ukrainian military leaves no hamster behind. Final clip I have for you is the Ukrainian national anthem played on an instrument that I haven't heard it be played on yet. So we're going to watch about one minute of uh, this two minute music clip together. That's all for this update video. Glory to the heroes, glory to Ukraine. If you found this video informative, give me a thumbs up. I greatly appreciate it. Comments or questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, take care, be safe.